going to go ahead and get started. Okay, good afternoon and welcome to the Energy, Climate Change and Environmental Justice Committee. Thank you, Mr. O'Farrell, Mr. Kokoya, Mr. Cedillo for being here this afternoon. I'm going to go ahead and take a public comment, uh, including general public comment. I've got cards for public comment from uh, Byron Barajas. Are you here? Yes, Come on up. Mr. Barajas, you have one minute of general public comment. Okay. I want to turn this document in uh, to this committee here. Um, what it pertains is to the full recovery of the United States, the last of which is the Space Fusion um, Program. Um, speaking on energy, uh, the, recently there's an article by Eric Holthus from the GRITS. His conclusion uh, remarks is that the world probably can't solve climate change without nuclear pow um, power. So this shift from the greenies uh, sticking just to solar and wind to nuclear power uh, should indicate uh, the future. Um, and maybe just a conclusive remark. I emphasize this material from our political organization, LaRouche Political Action Committee. If you really want to deal with the future aspects of where civilization is heading, we go to here. Thank you, Mr. Barajas. Just hand that over to the uh, our sergeant. Next speaker is Herman. Your uh, filled out cards for items one, two, three, four, five, and general public comment. You've got two minutes. On everything? Yes. Actually, I'm sorry. Uh, three minutes, including general public comment. Yes. Three minutes? For everything. For everything. Uh, two minutes? Two minutes for everything. Go ahead. Fuck. All right. Now that we're dealing with a U.S. infrastructure, as you heard that the Water and Powers Report, sanitation, our dilapidated pipes in the city of Los Angeles are still old, dated back to the 1800s. And as long as we have a development of fusion power, how will we ever gain from it? Well, Notorious for its corruption and abuse of taxpaying dollars, the city of Los Angeles, under item number three, it continued from uh, January 18, talks about the Water and Power Report response, asking for system litigation and settlement matter. You know why? I'll tell you why. We have a fucked up attorney called Mike Fear's office who represents the city of Los Angeles, and he can't litigate under the terms and conditions of public interest. You know why? Because he's a sellout. Now my general public comment, since I only got two fucking minutes to speak on all these items, the jackass had it on three minutes. So going back to um, my general public comment, as a reminder that we continue to um, provide uh, off of 15004 Oxnard Street in Van Nuys, we're not providing for infrastructure at a zip code 91411. But rather, we're finding out that the infrastructure of our restaurants in Ventura doing business as the Spearmint Rhino under number 96824 for the record, under PPRP number 170037, as, as I told the police commission, Richard T. Fank, your fucked up system of permit panel commission is allowing bitches to fuck the clients in a restaurant. How inappropriate is that? That's the same reason we got a dumb bitch, fat bitch, who can't do her job in the city of Los Angeles in Van Nuys, allowing this to happen. Mr. Ain't that Huffman, disgusting? Has anything to do with the jurisdiction of this committee. I'm talking about infrastructure, lady. The infrastructure of restaurants. You're not speaking on the items, and you're the not over the jurisdiction of this committee. Uh, uh, if you don't get back on topic, I'm going to remove you. We cannot explode the infrastructure of how to create jobs. If we don't have a climate of new change, new environmental justice, and stop the fucking in Van Nuys. Thank you. 
Sadia, you're right. I should shh, 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 because you know why? I'll tell you why. There are people in our local government who disguise themselves as good politicians, but instead they go around creating less jobs, more fucking, and more fat ass stupid issues that don't resolve any problems. Goodbye. <laughs> so that concludes uh, cards for uh, general items and general public comments. So we're going to close general public yes. at this time. Let's go ahead and call up item number five. Can you please read that into the record? Certainly, Madam Chair. Item number five relates to DWP report in response to motion, Bloomingfield Englander Harris Dawson, relative to request for the department to report on Aliso Canyon reliability winter action plan and related matters. Madam Chair, members, this matter was continued from your September 21st meeting, 2016. Okay, so members, we're now in our third winter since the gas leak on Aliso Canyon. So if you can just provide a, a rundown of our, your understanding um, of our current situation at Aliso Canyon and the statewide challenges that Southern California is currently experiencing. Okay, good afternoon. I am Chris Lynn, Director of Power Supply Operations. Fortunately, the region has had a mild winter. Uh, with, with, mild winter with mild winter, SoCal gas has avoided the need to withdraw the quantities of gas it would have in a normal cold winter. Um, three, the, uh, on November 28th, the winter, or I'm sorry, the Aliso Canyon winter assessment released by the CPC, the CEC, LADWP, and CalISO uh, showed that three pipeline out outages complicated Southern California's reliability. The gas import capability was reduced by 42 percent. Bottom lines, curtailments more likely this winter than last because of the pipeline rupture. Conservation needed to preserve so storage inventory for core customers. May, may, may curtail non-core besides electric generators to, pervert, to preserve storage inventory for core. A lot would depend on the winter and how cold it was or wasn't. Um, mitigations me measures were made. Um, the technical assessment team maintained all of the existing mitigation measures and added eight new ones. LADWP postponed a reconductoring in basin. This reconductoring ultimately by 2022 would, uh, would, would bring in 400 megawatt of renewable from outside of the region and that needed to be postponed until uh, next month. Um, winter does run through March. We're a third of the way through winter. But as of now, mild winter, uh, SoCal Gas has avoided the need to withdraw the quantities of gas it would in a normal cold winter. For this reason, the storage is near capacity and the risk of gas service curtailments in January and February appear to be significantly reduced. Mm -hmm. The uh, winter assessment is available at the CPUC and the CEC's website, and I can answer any questions you might have. Members, do you have any questions? I do not. No? Right. See now? Okay, thank you. Actually, oh, you I'm do? Sorry. Just sure. Fine. So you mentioned kind of in passing the use of alternative fuel generation of electricity in the event of peak. You're talking about firing up peaker plants that use diesel fuel, I assume, right? The, uh, well, I think, uh, I'm not clear on what, what part of your... It, well, the report indicates that as a last resort, uh, the department maintained the option of using alternative fuel at some of its in basin generation. That's yeah. peaker plant generation of electricity. Well, the alternate, so the, what I had mentioned was that, which is a little different, the, we postponed a reconductoring of our, our uh, transmission lines, and it would actually reduce the, the need for gas immediately in, in basin. Um, and then by 2022, that would, um, uh, it's a, it's a segment of a five-year project, basically, that would allow us to import, bring in renewables from outside of the L.A. region, and that had to be postponed. So, um, but, but we are on track to, to start it up again in February. I don't know. Did that answer your question, or was that what you're referring to? Maybe I was um, confusing what you said in your 
presentation and what it says in the report, but the report indicates that the department maintains the option as a last result, resort of using alternative fuel at some of its in basin generating stations for the purpose of avoiding blackout. Yes. That, those are well, peaker plants. So those are, yeah, so our in basin generating station, we do have some of our generating units with dual fuel. They burn natural gas and also diesel. And we do have a permit to burn the diesel if we are curtailed. Okay. Has that had to have? Have we had to utilize? We have not the, had to utilize within the last year, or say. No, we have. Great. Okay. Very good. Thank okay. you. That's what I need. Any other questions? Okay. I'm going to go ahead and move that we receive and file this motion. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Any objections? No. Seeing none. Let's go. Uh, let's go ahead and take up items one and two. Can you please read those uh, into the record, and we I can have uh, sanitation and DWP come forward, please. Go ahead. Certainly. Item number one, Bureau of Sanitation Report relative to the wet weather preparedness and response efforts for fiscal year 2017-18. And number two, Water and Power and Bureau of Sanitation to report in response to motion martinez buscano Krikorian relative to the impact of inclement weather of February 17, 2017. Okay, great. Good um, morning, Madam Chair. Do, do sanitation want to start first? Go ahead and just... Uh, Give us a quick overview uh, of our wet weather preparedness. Sure. Adal Hashwil, uh, Assistant General Manager with LA Sanitation. With me is Barry Bergren, who's the Operation and Maintenance Manager for our collection system and storm drain system. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Every year, uh, in anticipation of the wet weather season, LA Sanitation, working with sister departments, uh, prepare its system, both the wastewater system and the storm drain system, for the rain events. That includes ensuring that the, our uh, catch basins are cleaned at least once uh, most of them receive at least two cleanings uh, that our debris basins that we have, about 70 across the city, are in operating condition and are inspected. In addition, we continue to ensure that uh, our uh, systems, uh, backup systems, ensure power uh, at critical locations, especially at the wastewater pumping stations, are operational and equipped and that is in place. That is documented in a wet weather preparedness plan that is submitted to the Water Quality Control Board as part of our permit compliance. In addition, we prepare a report that has been transmitted to uh, your committee and uh, to council uh, summarizing this year's preparation uh, and, uh, and the different conditions that we have. Overall, uh, sanitation and the staff uh, are prepared, have prepared the system. However, we all know that uh, at, at, if we have heavy rain and, uh, and, and uh, major uh, downpour and tense drain, uh, our uh, storm drain system, uh, the streets are actually part of the drainage system and actually are expected to have uh, runoff in the streets. So we ask the community and the public to uh, be, c be careful driving and using our streets. At the same time, trash cans, as we are putting them out, ensure that they're not in the gutter so they're not washed away when we have rain. Uh, we are also using our uh, social media uh, and to communicate the need uh, to prepare, and uh, we prepared this year a simple flyer that uh, has been transmitted uh, through social media and to the council offices and as part of the report explaining how we prepared and also what can the public do to ensure uh, they're helping us also by ensuring loose materials that are on the street, on the, on the uh, front uh, yards, etc., are secure. Um, and basically, the key thing is we have put in place a 24-7 customer care center that it's available to the customers 24-7. That's something that has been in place for the last year and a half. We're very proud that we are available, and uh, you can call 311. That should transfer over to us, but also our number is 1-800-773-2489. But also you can reach us at social media, Facebook, and also at Twitter at LA, at LA City San. Um, 
So we continue working hard, we continue reviewing it. We have a storm, storm commander in place, and as the storm approaches, we will put our staff and our facilities on standby. Our staff will go on 12-hour shifts, and they're operating 24-7. We'll deploy them in the areas that we think are critical uh, and to ensure the fastest deployment, and that is in place, and we do that every year. So last storm, we did very well. Last year, uh, we actually did uh, reasonably well, except we had major uh, rain and uh, and uh, we had a, a major incident. Uh, I know Councilman Krokoyan remembers the incident that we had in his district. Uh, the sewer system is critical uh, also, which is the conveyance of our wastewater system. We have done since then a massive assessment to ensure every sewer has been inspected. And we have a schedule for repair in case it needs repair uh, to ensure that nothing similar to what happened last year when we had the combination of high flows combined with a major flooding and no drainage caused a sinkhole in uh, the community um, in Toluca Lake. Uh, with that, uh, uh, I will uh, refer to any questions from the committee. So I have a quick question before we get to the to DWP. So despite, despite the preparation, uh, the preparedness expressed in the November report, um, I still have constituents on L Lowell Street in North Hollywood who experienced severe flooding last week. So who provides individual support to them? Um, do we walk them through the resources available to them? I get that our crews go out there and make the repairs, but how do we actually do the hand-holding um, and get them the resources they need, especially when it wasn't their fault? Sure, sure. Um, and I've been involved in resolving this one issue. Uh, I have been Did you get the pictures? I got the pictures. Actually, I've been in communication with the individual this morning, okay. and your staff actually shot to me this morning, and we are actually working on resolving the issue. It's one thing that we need to also keep in mind. We need to invest in the stormwater system as a whole. The, the infrastructure for our drainage has not been uh, upgraded for a long, long time. That's why we're talking about more capture, infiltration, but there is locations in the city um, that uh, need to be upgraded. I, and I think in the report we referenced 400 locations across the city that need some kind of upgrade when it comes to uh, uh, drainage uh, upgrade. Uh, the Sun Valley North Hollywood area is one of the areas that we need to invest a little bit more. Uh, and, and we are working very hard on addressing it, but stormwater capture, uh, reducing the runoff is a big thing, but still we need to do investment. Uh, the issue that happened, uh, our staff should be the ones uh, working with the constituent. No constituent should feel alone. Uh, we will be there for them. Uh, I'm looking into this matter that happened uh, last January 8th uh, at that location. Uh, it happened, and it also happened last, last year. year when we so, had those. So what problems. we did, actually, what we did is actually that area, the actual street itself, is a little further north on Satikoi Street, uh, does not have a drainage system. And what has been done is actually a, a small uh, metal, corrugated metal pipe was built from next to the property in, 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 in reference that has been piped to take this, the flow from the street, uh, Leal Street, over to Satikoi. Um, we have been seeing it as a issue with a flat uh, drainage, not enough to carry the flow when you have rain. When this happened on this uh, uh, last uh, January 8th, we actually televised it this morning because I wanted to make sure there's nothing in between. You can see the opening is fine, the exit is fine. It's a flat metal pipe. It's not doing what it's supposed to as a for formal drainage. But we suspected there's something more, so we just televised it this morning, and we determined there's some actually structural damage in the private property that's crossing. Uh, we have issued an emergency request to do repair that is being addressed. Um, and, and to me, it's, it's, it's with the resources that we have, we should be there uh, addressing every one of these calls uh, and, and taking care of it. So the community can call us. We're all committed. I know, I know we are. Uh, available 24-7, but we would, I want to repeat the, the number, it's 1-800-773-2489 or 311, but also Twitter, you can also reach us on social media or Twitter. Uh, my staff is working with every council office field staff to ensure that they introduce themselves, they know who they are in the field, they exchange direct numbers to ensure that 
that we are there to support the community and the constituents. And once again, uh, what we, happened is something we we'll prevent. one more thing since you made reference to this in your, in your, uh, in your talk. Sure. So you mentioned the sinkhole last year. What in our protocols are in place now to communicate with the affected residents when something like that happens? What we have done a lot more, uh, and we're working with our public affairs office and the council office, uh, I believe we worked closely with Councilman Krokorian at that time to use social media to communicate. We worked closely with the, uh, with the TV media. We were very uh, open and, and transparent and providing detailed information. When we had the streets closed and when we had ready to open, we were actually talking to radio stations, to the public, uh, did interviews. I was there at 5.30 in the morning before we opened the street, at least one lane to provide information. Uh, yeah, we're working with the, the emergency management system. Uh, the emer emergency management department is critical and, and they're working, they have a system for reverse uh, calling to the constituents on a focused area. Um, I would ask also the community and the public to sign up on Notify LA. Notify LA is critical. It's your cell phone, your, 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 your personal phone, your home phone. Sign up on that one because any emergency will come up. We can call and target that area. Um, I think to me it's, it's every um, incident is for us something that we will learn from and move and become better. And I'm going to show you that we are getting better. Everything we're doing, our staff are there having a 24-7 operation, using social media, using the, the press as a way to get the word out and building that communication, working with your staff to get the word out. But also, the public can sign up on Notify LA to ensure that whenever we do reverse calling, that, that information gets communicated directly to them. Mr. Ofer, did you have something? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks, Adele, and thank you, staff. Uh, just a couple quick questions. You mentioned 400 upgrades that are needed. About how many of those are in the San Fernando Valley, of the 400 plus? <clears throat> that would say a large portion. I'm not sure exactly what the percentage is. I know for sure there's areas in the Sun Valley and North Hollywood, Upper North Hollywood, a lot of them. Um, do not have a drainage system. Um, so I would say across the city, it's distributed across the city. Right. Uh, but we can look at the percentage. Uh, we have available the listing and the location and the map. Uh, I'd rather not give, but I think it's a larger portion. I, I mean, I, I don't want to assume, but I would think so as well. And I, sure. I'm, I'm just, where I'm going is, uh, are your priorities being um, set uh, based on need? Uh, and I just wanted to put that out there. Uh, if that's where most of the problems are, then um, you know, maybe the priority should, should be in that direction. Also, this call center, you said 24-7. And is it only during storm season or the rainy season, or is it year-round? We, we, a year and a half ago, we started only for the rainy season, but now it's year-round. It's year-round. Every day. And as long as the budget can pay for that, then it, it shall continue yeah, to it's, it's, it's basically specially, specially funded by our operation. So it's 24-7. I think it's, it's the best thing that we have done. Uh, most people call us after 5. We need to be present after 5 and when the issue is needed. Uh, so that is a huge shift in our commitment to community and service. A lot of it because of your direction to us to ensure uh, that we are available. Uh, you know, each one of you have really asserted the need to ensure that we're available to the constituents when they need us, uh, not the next day. And then, and then lastly, Madam Chair, you mentioned uh, social media presence. Now, is someone monitoring Twitter 24-7 as well? Yeah, we, we have staff uh, available. Um, uh, we're all active in, in media and social media, right. but I think our, actually our staff, we have staff assigned uh, to doing that. Mm -hmm. And our public affairs office actually have uh, shifted uh, and they are putting staff on call mm -hmm. uh, and available to, available for any emergency. It, 24 hours, so there's a, a, a calling list of staff to ensure that they are addressing and providing that input. Thank you. Uh, so we do that, yes. Thanks. Anyone else? Yep. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Adele, for a uh, mm -hmm. thorough report. Thank you for the progress you're making, uh, by the way, on stormwater recharge uh, that was indicated in the report. That's um, been a priority of mine, as you know, in the San Fernando Valley, and um, we're making progress there. Um, much more still to be done. Um, so uh, 
Mr. O'Farrell asked about the chronic flood locations, the 400 priority locations. Um, and I'm guessing that the vast, a very high percentage are in the valley because of the presence of the LA River, the overdevelopment and overpavement of the valley, and the fact that most of the drainage of the San Fernando Valley comes through my district um, and on its way to the river. So I would very much like to see that, that list as soon as possible. Sure. Um, number two, you mentioned in the report the prioritization of uh, certain catch basins as high priorities based on their, you know, the data that you derive from how much trash is in each one. Is there a correlation with the 400 priority chronic flooding locations as well? Because it seems to me that those locations should also work their way up the priority list for catch basin cleaning to mit mitigate some of the chronic uh, I'll, Between Barry and I, I think I'll have Barry talk about the, the issue about catch basin cleaning frequency, but I'll have a discussion at the end about the prioritization. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Barry Bergen with LA Sanitation. Uh, in regards to the catch basin cleaning, uh, we go through and we identify any catch basin that had was full 50% or greater will receive three additional cleanings during wet weather. Um, particularly troublesome basins we put on our wet weather plan, and those are monitored throughout the storm. So if we know that there is this chronic location, our staff is going to uh, patrol that 24 hours a day. Okay, terrific. Um, now, we also have to coordinate with the county's infrastructure, of course, to ensure uh, that the system is working. And after the station fire, um, I recall when I represented that part of the city that um, an awful lot of debris had accumulated in the Big Tahunga wash, uh, dam, in the Big Tahunga catch basin uh, behind mm -hmm. the dam. And um, when it came time for the rains, uh, the, the subsequent storms, there wasn't a lot of capacity left because that dam and reservoir was filled. But Mr. Herman, be quiet. You've spoken. Be quiet. Sit there in silence so that we can do our work. Um, that uh, basin had accumulated so much debris that it didn't have much water capacity. So how do we determine that the county is also doing its work in clearing the larger infrastructure before it gets to us? Uh, we work closely with the uh, county as far as uh, clearing out the debris basins. And when we have uh, incidents that happen like this year, we've had several fires in the area. Uh, we have a monthly meeting where LA County is present with EMD and we make sure that everything is uh, cleaned out, ready to go. And if we have any issues, uh, whether it's city related or it's the county related, if it's in the city of LA, we are going to respond. But we also have uh, mutual agreements where we're in constant contact during storms. If they have a problem, uh, we're there to assist. Likewise with us, they could assist with us. Okay, so has everything upstream of us on the county side of the ledger now been fully cleared and is at full capacity? Yes, to the, to the best of our knowledge, yes. Okay. Um, now, much of the report talked about the use of the uh, sanitary sewer system to take on excess stormwater in high volume uh, incidents. Um, and that, as I understand the sinkhole situation that happened in my district, uh, w was that one of those situations or was it just because of um, washing out of the support structure? For the sewer line? There's a combination of things that happen in that district, but usually uh, sewers as a whole, as you know, the, we have a, a large 140,000 uh, uh, maintenance holes in the streets. Uh, those are the access points. A lot of them are not purely tight system. Uh, you know, they allow some water to go in. Uh, also, normal uh, seepage into the house connections. Uh, in the city, we estimate there's 11,000 uh, miles of privately owned house connections from the home to the sewer, as compared to 6,500, 6,700 that we own. A lot of the cracks in these systems allow for some water. So our system has, allows for, actually has, a, a takes water in, which is normal. Our system is actually one of the lowest uh, uh, 
systems that have uh, what's called inflow infiltration, wet weather flow that goes into the sewer system. Other systems have a, a multiplier of 40 hours, probably two. The system that, that happened is thing called, it was a combination of one, the sewer was actually an, an old sewer, uh, shallow, there was no drainage above it, the street was cracked, so all that water that was ponding with the heavy rain had no place to go except through that. And then basically washed the soil with it and the sewer was a, mecha, a place to allow that soil to go in, causing that problem. Uh, so it's, it's a multiple things and as I said uh, from there, we actually went in and identified and did a com comprehensive assessment of all the sewers in the entire city. Uh, the ones that have a potential of failure, the aging ones, the ones are in areas that are prone to flooding, etc., and assessed and identified what needs to be done, and those are in being taken care of, prioritized, and, uh, and are being addressed. And uh, so it's a combination of things that happen. It's not purely just uh, the flow in the sewer, but actually mainly is the, if you, if you remember that street, that street was cracked up and had no place for drainage to go in and it just went through the soil and it was a sandy soil and just went in. Okay, and then finally, um, the 400 priority projects um, are going to get built when funding becomes available. So I want to talk about the funding a little bit because right now, um, much of the increased demand on our stormwater system is caused by development in the San Fernando Valley and development elsewhere as well, but at least from our perspective, development of new buildings, new pavement, new parking lots, new all of those things that mm. covers what used to be natural infiltration and channels that water into the, into the streets. We have the low in impact development uh, initiative that you led and um, that reduces that somewhat. But right now, do developers pay any fee that supports the construction of stormwater infrastructure? So uh, as a development in the city of Los Angeles, if you do anything more than 500 square feet, you're required to capture the 85 percentile storm on site for infiltration and reuse. That's as part of the low impact development ordinance that the council approved in 2012. They, if there is no storm drain available to, to as part of the, the development review uh, through the entitlements and through the permitting process, et cetera, the adequacy of the drainage system is reviewed. And, and if it is a need to upgrade the drainage system or to build additional drainage to provide service to that development, they will do it under a B permit. It's a condition of the development that's put in place under the uh, entitlements and the requirements of that. So many of the valley areas that do not have drains and you are developing, uh, something has to be done to mitigate the additional flow. Uh, with the LID it does that, but also you may have to be required to extend a drain uh, from the main drain uh, upstream uh, to service your property. And that is required usually as part of the uh, uh, requirements of the development and the permitting process. I don't think they pay a fee, there's no fee, I don't think that's available, but the two conditions I think to address that is one is the LID that we have in place since 2012, and the second is the review as part of the entitlements and the permitting process to require them to either uh, build a storm drain system to allow for them to drain into it. Okay, so some of those sorts of on-site projects are exceedingly expensive for a developer, and I'm wondering if we might not have a, 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 if we could consider a system by which a payment of a fee in lieu of doing that actual construction would be more cost effective for the developer and also provide you with a source of funds in a special fund that you can do citywide infrastructure. It, it makes a lot of sense. Actually, we have a draft uh, proposal that it's a, uh, revision to our uh, LID ordinance. Uh, we're checking with the state water control board because a lot of the LID is a mandated by the stormwater permit. And for us to allow a developer to go without doing the LID on site, it requires a, a relief. So I think we are on the same page, Councilman. So what you're going to see hopefully uh, very soon through this committee and then through council 
a modified low impact development ordinance that provide multiple options. One in Luffy that can be spent in a specific area to provide relief for drainage without specifically talking about it, so exactly what you're saying. The second option is the developer themselves can identify a location in the city that's cheaper to develop uh, and they can go in and develop that stormwater project, uh, whether it's a wetland, whether it's a capture infiltration, in an area that needs to be developed anyway, uh, and it's cheaper to develop and maximizing their development, they will go do it, and that would meet their demand. If they do more and manage more runoff, which we encourage, they'll get a credit for the additional one that they can use other places. We'll be in communication, we'll come to your committee for policy with the chair and yourself and others, but on the same page, but the first step we need to do is get the kind of the thumbs up from the, the regulators, and I think we may be close. They may put some restrictions as to where the money gets spent within that same sub-watershed, which I think we're okay with it. Uh, and as soon as we have something, we'll come and have a discussion with, with, with your offices and hopefully have it before your committee for a policy and discussion. Mr. Kokorian, um, and members, we are expecting a holistic um, uh, report back from sanitation on all of our stormwater and runoff infrastructure needs, correct? Yes. We can include this piece as well. And, and the overall funding discussion on a county-wide so when, it, when are we expecting that report to come here? Uh, well, probably soon, I would say, I will talk to your staff and we'll try to figure out how we can schedule. We're ready to discuss good that, conversation as well. but it'd be a good discussion. Maybe it, uh, if it's okay, we can, uh, as, long as, we, as soon as we get the discussion from the regional board and maybe bring all that, including that in Correct. Luffy and the discussion mm -hmm. to have that and have you guys, uh, have your committee provide us the direction that you want us to do. So on uh, February 6th, we have a pretty jammed agenda. Yeah, but maybe the pos possibly the following meeting. If we can schedule it in March, I think that would help us. Uh, okay. I think it will be a good timing for it. And include this as well. Mm -hmm. We will. Right. Thank um, you. Is that all the questions for sanitation? Yeah. So let's go ahead and have DWP present um, on how you handle our outages, whether it's water or power. Yeah. Good afternoon, Commission uh, Council Members. I'm Zandra Kendall, Assistant General Manager for Power System. With me is Dan Barnes, Director of our Power Transmission and Distribution Division. Uh, just touching back, in February of last year, we had a very large storm. Uh, it's important to know that, that we had an excessive amount of rain coming off of five years of drought. Um, with that, uh, ground was saturated. During that drought time, we had a lot of trees that, that died. Um, and as we had this rain, and, and then the trees tended to break, branches broke off as they got soaked with water. Um, trees fell over, uh, which caused an excessive amount of outages. During that storm of the four days, February 17th to 21st, we had over 175,000 customers out through the duration of the storm. Uh, at the peak of the storm, we had over 900 employees in the field working to restore power. Um, our outage management system, handled over 18,000 calls during that four-day period. Uh, during that period, our outage management system crashed, which caused delays to us issuing jobs, to um, us being able to get jobs closed and, and show that customers were re-energized and to make contact with customers. So we were able to resolve that. Um, as a result of that, we've taken and put in place uh, additional redundancy in our systems, added backup systems, so that if we have an issue, then the system won't, won't suffer that same failure. Uh, since then, using what we've learned from that storm and some of the failures at that point, um, we had 68% uh, of our customers were, re were restored power within 24 hours. For us, that's an unacceptable level. Uh, in the last two storms we've had, we've had 99.6% of our customers restored within a 24-hour period. Um, so we've taken what we've learned from those. Um, we, we monitor the National, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration weather reports as so we know ahead of time when storms are coming in. Um, we look at what conditions they expect us to face during those storms. So we bring in additional people. Um, we have a 24-7 trouble response group, 365. Uh, we make available the rest of our field personnel both in town and then to the extent of uh, the storm and the number of outages, we bring uh, employees in from outside uh, 
the city, um, Nevada, Utah, when necessary. Um, so we make sure we have all the resources. We also, uh, if it gets bad, we have contractors that, that work for us that we make available for restoration. Um, what we've stepped up as well is our uh, tree trimming ahead of time, going out and annually trimming trees to make sure that we're clearing our power lines and reducing as much of that uh, risk that we see as we can. Um, we continue with our power system reliability plan that you guys voted uh, to fund um, to proactively go out and, and upgrade our infrastructure, replacing the cross arms that tend to fail during these kind of conditions, um, replacing cables, replacing poles. So we're currently aggressively replacing our infrastructure, which as these storms continue to come will impact, lessen the impact of these storms. Um, we monitor what type of storm it is, whether it's going to be a heat storm, whether it's going to be a rain storm, whether a wind storm, because each of those poses a different uh, risk to the system, and we plan accordingly to that. Um, you know, for when we're during the storms now, we bring in additional customer service staff. We bring in additional people to support our trouble board. Um, we're using social media to reach out to customers uh, to report on the outages and and make them aware of where it's going on when they don't have you know, access to their internet. So we're, we're constantly working to improve that. Um, we, if you look at the, the forecast, we have a storm forecast coming up for this weekend and into next week. So right now we're taking steps to plan and prepare for that storm and to be prepared to respond accordingly. Um, so we've taken these steps and we've uh, been able to reduce outages through our preparedness and our planning and we're able to respond to these customer outages and make better notifications to the customer um, and again bringing in additional staff to assist our trouble dispatch group too. A majority of the customers that kind of tend to get lost are the single customer outages because they get kind of lumped into the large customers. So now we have additional people that come in and they'll call those customers and, and make sure that once that outage is restored, then they don't get left out. We confirm whether they're still out and we can respond. So we're making great progress as far as being able to notify our customers and getting our power restored um, within that 24 hour period. So are we proactively calling or alerting customers um or is our communication only limited to those who call us or those who follow up on social media? And what are other utilities doing? In some cases, uh, some of our, our ability to notify and get out with customers is kind of limited until we fully engage with our smart grid, smart meter program. So we're not Currently, there. we're not quite there yet. Um, but we are texting. You know, we're working right now and we're fairly close for customers to be able to text us and report outages, which is something new and, and a step we're getting closer to. Um, again, we're proactively using social media in those areas. We have a callback system for customers who do opt into that. We don't currently call all customers at this point, um, but we're working towards that ability. And what are other utilities doing in this area? Um, a lot of the other utilities are, are ahead of us when it comes to smart meters. Um, they have a little bit more ability to identify who's out and who's, who's still, uh, who has been restored, and then they have the ability to, to reach out to those because it, it, it reduces the numbers dramatically on, on who you would have to call. And how quickly is our call center staff informed of the incidences um, in order for them to be able to respond to the customer, or are we just leaving As soon as we home? know of the outage, it's in the system. Uh, yeah, whether the right. customer, whether it comes from the customer, to us, whether it comes from our internal systems, um, as soon as we know of the outage, it's inputted into our system and it's visible to them. Hmm. Members, are there any questions? Do you have a question, yeah. Mr. Farr? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so, Mr. Kendall, question. Uh, you mentioned, uh, uh, or I, I sensed from when you spoke that there isn't necessarily a system to notify customers in advance. Are you linked into the Notify LA platform by any chance, or could you be? Question. That I don't have the answer to. Uh, because that could will, be an opportunity to find explore out. so that people could sign up and Great get alerts suggestion. from DWP and uh, the city. I thought uh, they did. I just assumed that you were part of that network. 
Yeah, that I don't know. I will get you an answer. Is there a reason why, though? That could be a good low-cost sort of uh, minimal trouble sort of way for just link up uh, with that platform. Uh, so it would be a one-stop shop for customers. And that's managed by the emergency management department. Ma okay, yeah. Of emergency course. What year again? Emergency, emergency management, management department uh, and, uh, and, and, yeah. You are. Okay, so when, someone, so when someone signs up for that, notify LA, they also get the alerts from DWP. I thought so. Okay. On outages, yes. I thought so, because I, right. I get notified. Great. Okay. Uh, and then uh, also, similar to what I asked of sanitation. Do you want to, yeah. Joe, oh, sure. to come up and say yeah. something? Grab a chair. Sure. Mm -hmm. Just you have to come up with your own chair, unfortunately. BYOC. Bring your own chair. <laughs> we, Together with, uh, thank you, Madam Chair um, and members. Together with Power System staff, we've met with City ITA mm -hmm. to better integrate our automated information from our outage management system together with a My311 app okay. um, and Notify LA. Now, Notify LA is only when they push send to those members. So because we don't have smart meters in place, we can't notify everybody when they're off. We're working on letting them report, as Andy said, they're working on letting them report when, to us when they're off on a mobile device or on a website. But the My311 app, they've made improvements um, or in the process of making improvements to make it more visible where the outage information is on that app. That was my next question. Are you partially or fully integrated then with My311 LA? What we've discussed with them is when we, for example, publish a, um, an outage update, which we distribute as press releases to your offices and to anybody who signs up, that they would have a feed that would automatically be able to then make that visible on the My311 app, and we're working with um, City ITA to make that happen. All right, and then in terms of the call center in general, are you integrated, are the call centers integrated, and are they 24-7 during, especially during winter weather for LADWP? Our, our call center is up 24-7. It is, okay, so you have a body there that, okay. And the same for social media, someone monitor social media? Social media during regular conditions when it's not storm. Um, when our after hours on call staff get a media call, they check social media um, and respond. Um, during storm mode where we're over 10,000 customers for a sustained period of time, we do keep someone on staff that usually goes till about 11 p.m. midnight and then picks up again at 5 a.m. Okay, so a 311 operator will field the calls to sanitation or LADWP and someone will be there 24-7 in, in each circumstance. Okay. Yeah. Uh, terrific. Thank you. So today's uh, <clears throat> action is to adopt the motion instructing you to report back to committee. So can we add these additional points in the report? Mr. Yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, the Chair asked earlier about what other utilities are doing. Now, the IOUs have to report outages to the PUC uh, and to the Cal ISO, right? But but we operate differently as a muni, I think. So, um, and, and as I recall, there was some legislation a few years back to require munis to report outages as well that didn't go anywhere. So, um, how do we compare in terms of customer days of outages uh, with the IOUs and with surrounding municipal utilities? Do we have any kind of comparative information that will give us some insight as to system reliability? Yeah, on a... Right now, when we look at our outage durations, our outage frequencies, we are in the first and second quartile as compared to um, our other, both, both public utilities around us and, um, and the IOUs. So we, uh, we compare favorably as far as our, our durations and our frequencies. Could, could we, if, with the report back, have some of that comparative data as well, just so the committee can understand where we where we rank and where Absolutely. we might be. Absolutely. Thank you. As we com compare it to other utilities? Yeah. Any, any other questions? Okay, seeing none. So let's go. I'm going to go ahead. And did you have one, a question, Mr. Uh, I'm going to recommend that we adopt recommendations in the um, sanitation report, which is item one, and then also adopt the motion um, in item two. Okay. Any objections? Seeing none, that will be the order. Thank you very much. Um, Let's go ahead and move on in our, to items three and four. And then we're going to have Mr. David Wright come up to the table. Certainly. Madam Chair, item number three. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Right. Motion, Martinez Englander, requesting Department of Water and Power and City Attorney report on the status of the customer information system litigation related matter. And number four, 
relates to also a report from the Department of Water and Power and the City Attorney and ordinance relative to amending certain sections of the administrative code pertaining to contracting for the Department of Water and Power. Thank you. Um, Mr. Mr. Wright, I just wanted to get an overview of where things are at with our uh, in regards to our uh, billing system issues and if there's anything in particular that we should be um, prepared or be made aware of. I don't know if that conversation needs to take place in closed session or not. I, I can provide you an update in open session on, okay. on where we're at. Uh, and whenever we need to go into closed session, please let us know. Because I know there was a, a lawsuit regarding this issue. So as you know, um, with the implementation of the billing system, we ended up overcharging several hundred thousand customers, most of them $20 or less. We spent about a year running all sorts of computer routines to cover every possible uh, situation where a customer could be overcharged and identified those hundreds of thousands of customers where we made an overcharge. We sent them letters about the lawsuit. They were able to either say, I am going to accept this amount that you found that uh, I was overcharged, or they could contest that amount, and we gave them an independent uh, phone company phone number to call so that they didn't, they weren't dealing directly with us. They could feel there was that independence there which existed, and they went through that process. Um, some customers did uh, contest, but the vast majority of them um, accepted the, the amounts that we calculated. There were some situations where we couldn't calculate, and I'll give you a good example. If somebody, if we had overdrafted an account incorrectly, and there was an overdraft fee that the customer was hit with at their checking account, um, they would be able to provide that information to us, and then we could go through the process and calculate uh, th their refund. That was one of those where we couldn't calculate it. We had to have some documentation. Right now, those credits that we calculated to those several hundred thousand customers are being credited to their current utility bills, and they should all be finished within this first quarter of 2018. So we're very close to the point where almost every customer has been made whole, 100%, 100 cents on the dollar, as we've said. They've been um, credited with every bit that we've overcharged. And the few people that had to make the proactive claims we're working through those. Sometimes we have to go out to their home or business and actually visit them, and we're working through those. And those should be done within the first couple quarters of 2018. Um, so we are getting very close to that uh, that class action lawsuit for uh, for uh, most of those uh, those class actions to be finished and 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 uh, I don't want to say put to bed, but it, we're, we're going to be done with that. So um, again, pretty much all customers who had an overcharge are getting the refunds. Every one of them that we could calculate are hitting their bills right now. And again, there's a few um, that, that will be closed in the near future. Any other questions on item three? Okay. Um, let's go ahead and um, receive and file this motion. Um, I think you've already read um, item four into the record. Do you want to do that again? We can have the, our ratepayer advocate come to the table. Okay. So I'd like to start with this. And um, this is one of those weird situations where I have it, the most uh, applicable case study I've ever had. And I have a visual aid. Oh, wow. We like it. All right. It's like go and tell. <laughs> Where I used to work, we had the same re types of restrictions that we currently have right now that we're creating inefficiencies. This is a piece of a generator. It's a bearing that cost about 15,000 bucks. With the cost to make the repair, it was a, a couple hundred thousand dollars. And the general manager didn't have the authority to, uh, to direct that change and that repair immediately. The board didn't have the ability to create a, a longer-term maintenance contract or, or licenses, as we're talking about in one of these ordinances, quickly. And so this $200,000 repair required a months-long RFP process to meet the bureaucratic, um, kind of outdated uh, purchasing requirement. And during that time, we had to buy replacement power during a summer. And it cost our ratepayers millions of dollars when it could have just cost $200,000. Um, you might understand, uh, like, wonder why I have this here. My, because it was so frustrating, literally staff presented this to me when I left that utility as a reminder of 
working towards overcoming inefficiencies and bureaucracies where they didn't make sense. Mm -hmm. and, and the same thing is happening essentially with the request for the, these ordinance changes. The ordinances are out of date, don't meet industry standard, don't even meet the standards of other departments within the city of LA. And if we can make these changes, that sort of inefficiency won't occur, and those costs don't have to be passed on to the rate payers. Now, I can go into any of the details of the request, but it's this kind of thing we're trying to resolve, increasing the ability to get that repair made timely, increasing the ability of the board when, it, when it's obvious that you have to go with one vendor, which you did here, had to go with the vendor that created the generator that made it, or the software licenses that you can't get from some other, other vendor, and then finally, the ability to um, tender into a bit longer contracts than just, uh, than just three years, moving them to five years. And again, it's reducing that inefficient overhead that the current ordinance requires and allowing us to be more effective, more efficient, but sticking within industry standards. So um, uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions if you want to go into detail or w whatever uh, direction you'd like to go. Mr. Pickles, did you want to add anything? Yes. Um, we think the proposal adds important transparency uh, to com certain components of the process that don't exist now. Uh, and we support higher limits and fewer restrictions than existed even this improved proposal. Uh, the reason for that is the size of DWP. Uh, there are 1,100 utilities, public and private, that report their information to the U.S. Department of Energy, Energy Information Administration. DWP is 16th among that list of public and private utilities. They're the largest public utility. There are about 200, less than 200, uh, investor-owned utilities. So they're even among the investor utilities. They're top 10%. Um, and if you add in, these are all power utilities, if you add in the water revenue, uh, DWP is clearly in the top 10. It's 16th overall on its power revenue. So it's a big entity. And we did a short, uh, what I call a casual survey of electric utilities and their limits and, uh, in 2016. And we were told that people rarely have their CEOs have less than a $15 million authority. So we would suggest that this authority ultimately be moved up to uh, 15 million. Um, and there are other restrictions on the types of contracts in this proposal. We think that should all be reviewed. We, we support going ahead with this proposal now, but it should be reviewed in uh, no less than a year for possible improvements. Um, can you talk a little bit about what the safeguards are in place? Um, uh, for council, should we have um, concerns about this? Good afternoon, council members. Uh, Joseph Privates, general counsel for the department. So, the many of the actually all the provisions and, and the safeguards that you have in place now still exist. So, for instance, if you take the expanding board authority from three years to five years, those actions are still subject to 245. Ooh. From, from the council, you've just expanded the time period. The contracts that require a move, uh, affirmative approval, so let's say we're building a new power facility, those still have to come to council for affirmative approval. So the, the only addition that you're making in with respect to, to that provision is you're expanding it from three years to five years. You've maintained all your safeguards. With respect to the mm -hmm. expansion of the, the GM's authority from, from 150 to 5 million, the, the same protections that existed in the previous ordinance are still there, and there are quarterly reporting requirements to the council as well. So all the safeguards that you have in place continue to stay in place. You're just expanding the, the limits. Members, any questions? I have a, I have a quick Mr. question. Fair. Just uh, thank you, Madam Chair. In relation to Mr. Pickle's suggestion about expanding the authority from five to fifteen million, how do you feel about that, Mr. Wright? I, I, I <laughs> like the well. I like the exact direction that the ratepayer advocate that Dr. Pickle recommended, which is let's go to this now. I, I, I believe let's. 
taking things sometimes in incremental steps. Mm -hmm. This is a great point now. And then let's look at it in a year and be able to come back. This would uh, help tremendously reduce the administrative uh, expenditures by mo most of our contracts are under $5 million. Mm -hmm. So let's see how much benefit we would right. get over the next year by doing the increase and then come back and report to you then and, and see uh, the benefits that might occur at that point. Very sensible. Uh, one of my other concerns are restrictions on the type of contracts to which the increased limit applies. Uh, we think, for example, on personal services contracts being limited or not being subject to the new limit but be under the old very low limits, we think those that number should be moved upward mm -hmm. as well. Uh, if, if not to the a higher, say, $15 million level, certainly higher than 150000 it would be great if after a year we could quantify the savings to the ratepayers based on this ordinance. We will. We'll, we will collaborate on that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, one of the provisions with regard to uh, technical services contracts is changing to this competitive sealed proposal idea rather than a typical RFP, and I don't understand what the difference is. What is a competitive sealed proposal so council member that that uh, allows you to take other items into consideration other than just price so generally if you go out for a low bid contract that's it's, it's based on price here it allows you the opportunity to consider such things as life cycles and and other issues as well within that that competitive process so you still have a competitive process but it's not limited to to low bid well we can include all those things in the RFP scoring system now, can't we? I mean, what do we gain by this? I mean, I, I assume there's a time savings, but... There are often a number of... If you're in a competitive sealed bid approach, often you can open things up for creative proposals. And in a creative proposal, you don't know what you're going to get. And in the technology area, that's especially I true. It allows for post-bid negotiation of very technical components. Very creative. Mm -hmm. Makes sense to me. <laughs> Any other questions? Seeing none. Okay, thank you very much. Let's go ahead and adopt the draft ordinance dated back in October 13th, 2016. I have to double-check those uh, dates. <laughs> <laughs> Any objections? Seeing none, that will be the order. Our meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Visualize.